and I'm an economist and I work in Seldu on a lot of things which many of us work on including inequality and labor markets and working with data to look at things like education and employment and wages and all the usual Seldu stuff. Um, so my talk today doesn't have any equations nor does it have any tables or stars. And really what I want to do is actually just talk through, I need to give a little bit of a theoretical framing to the stuff that Murray and Patricia and a lot of the guys coming after me are going to talk about, right? So we are primarily an empirical research unit and for the most part, that's what we do. We work with data, we do lots of statistical analysis, but underlying that, there's a whole lot of thinking which involves theories which we have to bring to bear on the data, right? So it's not just we, that we're running code and getting some statistics all the time, we're actually doing a kind of interactive thought process mapping between theory and empirical work and then asking do these match, do they match, what else could be the issue, etc. And so I want to talk just a little bit about some of the stuff in the inequality field that is often hidden behind all the tables and pictures that we talk about. Okay, so when we talk about inequality and you read about it all the time and you see it in the newspapers, what do we mean? And inequality of what? So there's several different dimensions of which inequality could be manifest, right? So we could talk about racial inequality, we could talk about gender inequalities, we can talk about income inequalities, of power, of education, land, assets, there's all sorts of important things that people could mean when we're talking about inequality. And many times, we're not very precise when we talk about it. So one of the things that is often useful is to ask someone about which precisely, which dimensions precisely are you talking about? And it's useful both for the kind of clarity of your conversation, but it's also useful because these inequalities intersect. Or as Patricia was saying, inequalities in early childhood development lead to inequalities in later lifetime labor market outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so those are one of the ways we think of designing interventions or policies that we want to target lifetime earnings, but we might want to actually, the policy would be at basic education. Right? And then one of the things often, which we don't talk about much, but it gets serious when you're talking about measurement, is inequality amongst who? So always we're talking about the inequality within a group. Does the group include refugees? Does the group include illegal immigrants? Yes or no? That's a question which needs to be made clear. Most of the time when we're talking here, we don't specify, but we're using our surveys. And our surveys, you'd have to go back into the sampling frameworks, would not exclude people based on citizenship or on the legality of their presence in the country. And so conceptually, we would be talking about all people who are resident in South Africa, right? A third dimension, which again matters, is the time period, right? And a simple way to see this is, it's related to what Patricia was talking about again. We're gonna talk a lot <laughs> the same, but the point is that imagine if everyone earned the same, identically the same, but young people earned half what older people earned. And you, would, you only worked for two periods and then you retired. So you would find inequality at the moment in time because some people are old and some people are young. And it would look like there's some level of inequality in society. But if you ask, well, everyone lives for two periods and everyone gets the low wage to begin with and the high wage thereafter, over the course of a lifetime, it would be a completely equal society. Can you see the difference? That there's a dynamic measure of inequality which would be completely egalitarian even though the cross-sectional measure, which has some old people and some young people at the same time, would show some distribution here. And so it matters to be clear what type of inequality we're asking. And one of the things Patricia think cuts into, which is quite a big one, is dynastic levels of inequality, that family structures or group structures can have centuries-long persistence effects. There's one really interesting paper about Italy from like the 13th century to now and people using people's last names and finding that the, n the noble names from that six, seven centuries ago now still correlates with being in the top end of the income distribution. So these really can be um, 
important di dynastic group. Okay. So by inequality, I'm just maybe this is kind of superfluous, but let's just go through it. We mean the dispersion or spread of variance in some variable, right? And by dispersion, we just mean how far apart are the different people or the different groups. So variance is a statistical measure, but if you said that people are different, the question is how many people are different and how far apart are they? That's our two big dimensions that we care about here, right? So when we're thinking about income, which is what the whole day is pretty much about, we want to ask how rich are the rich relative to the middle and how poor are the poor relative to the middle? If the poor are very poor or the rich are very rich, we're going to have higher inequality. And second, how big are the different groups? If you've got a small group of poor people who are earning way out there, that's going to have high inequality. If you've got a large middle class, then by construction, the mass of your distribution is in the middle. And so it's going to be quite hard to have high measured inequality if you've got a large middle class. One of the things that we saw from Murray early on is that your middle class is not more than 20% in this country. Your poor and your severely poor counts for over 50%. And so you've got a lot of people in the poor group, your middle class here, and I'm kind of mixing up the middle of the distribution and middle class, but the point is that the elite tail, which was not even so elite actually, was like five percentage points. And so you've got this very small rich tail which goes out and out and out. And so that's kind of an intuitive way to think about why our measured inequality is so high, right? We, if you did comparatively to other countries, we're gonna, you'll see that a lot of countries have way bigger middle classes, the middle of the distribution is much bigger, and the tails just don't go out that far, especially the upper tail. Martin's gonna talk a bit more about that later this afternoon, I guess. So income, income is even conceptually more interesting. We had a question earlier on about what definition of income, and the, it's a, pertinent question is relevant because there's different definitions and they matter, right? So generally we would aspire to using a comprehensive definition of income which could be articulated as how much you could consume while holding your net worth constant, right? And that's conceptual. So if I have like a hundred dollars of rent and next period there's 10% growth, so I've got 110, but I also earned $10, that I could spend 20, right? That would be my potential consumption. And where it becomes harder is when you've got public services, because how do we quantify, if you want to include public services, if you think that the healthcare provision, the public healthcare, the public transport networks, the public education system is all valuable, then how do we quantify that for our surveys? Right? For someone like me who doesn't get sick often, and most people in our age group, I'm guessing that the public health thing is more of an option value. If you've got a good pu functioning public health system, it's actually valuable because it, it gives you peace of mind that if something does happen, then it's taken care of. And so how do you try to value these things? That's just a really hard question. I'm not gonna try and get into it, but the point is that income itself is not such a straightforward, it's not your paycheck, it's not just your paycheck. Um, okay, so income inequality is the distribution of income amongst members of a group, in our case, the South African residents, with some, within some interval of time. Generally, we're talking of a month or a year in the South African case, most of the time, um, because the questions will be asked in the last month, how much did you make and how much did you use and how much did you spend and things like that. Okay, so this is kind of similar to the slide that Murray had, uh, which he attributed to, I think, Ingrid. But we start with household market income. So that's basically sum up all your individual earnings. In this case, earnings has a specific meaning. Earnings is income from labor. Earnings is the stuff you work for, okay? So you take all your earnings and you add it up across all the people in your household. And then you add in any capital income. So if you got stocks, if you got interest, rent is a particular one because within our definition, rent gets attributed even if you don't pay to yourself. So like you own a house, you're not renting it out, you live there and you don't pay rent, 
but you would have to try to figure out how much rent you would have paid for that house if you were renting it because that's a type of income right so there's a lot of capital and a lot of people even if they don't seem to have capital have home ownership it's probably the biggest source of mass um, equity so you don't want to try and impute the rents private transfers those are remittances and then you would add in state transfers. In our case, state transfers would be your old age pension, your foster care grant, your child support grant, disability grants, to get a gross income. And then you would take out your taxes, things like, um, well, PAYE would be the most direct one, but you have things like your sin taxes and maybe VAT and things like that, to see how much people, households could consume. And here we get into another thing that sometimes we're talking about household inequality, and we would stop there and suddenly we're talking about individual inequality. And it just depends, actually, the researchers need to make clear what they're talking about, which is not always straightforward. Um, so then you would get per capita, you divide by the number of equivalent people in the house. And that's again, it's a matter of choice. But generally you would think of children as being less costly than adults. And so you divide by, let's say, each child counts for half a person, or something like that. And so a family of four, you might divide by three to get per capita expense, something like that. Um, and it's partly about the children, but partly also because of returns to scale within the household. So the point is, when we're talking of inequality or changes in inequality, basically any of these kind of components here would lead to a change in inequality probably, right? So change in the labor market would lead to a change in individual earnings, which would then change your household level earnings. Change in the government's taxation rates would change your disposal of income, and we would still get some change in our inequality level. And so even if you think of like Cape Town's property market, which is the rents have just shot up dramatically in the last five years, again, that's going to change both the cost for some people who rent, but it's also effectively changing your imputed rent for all the homeowners, even though you wouldn't know it because you're just living in the same house that you've always been living in, right? But you got richer, <laughs> isn't that cool? So you see, but you see the point that if you want to actually target your end point, you've got to think in this framework somewhere here, where are you planning to have an impact? And potentially on many things. So Patricio did a better job than I did here. Um, why focus on inequality? So I think there's two broad groups, right? One is the moral argument. People think that this is just unfair. You have really high levels, it's not right. And I think that's actually quite a widely supported position that lots of people with questions of fairness and norms will say it's not acceptable. Um, and partly it's about super high earners, possibly, probably, most likely, don't deserve to have so much. And there's this other way of justifying it. So people have ways of articulating their concerns. And one of it is how do you justify some people having so much when most people have so little, right? But there's another strand which is relatively recent, uh, relatively meaning 15, 20 years now, which is growing, which, have, which says that inequality also has a lot of negative potential economic effects, right? So high levels, especially like extreme levels, which South Africa is clearly part of, can limit human development, can make the economy less efficient, can induce political instability, can make society less trusting, health problems have been correlated with this. And so there's like a whole basket of things which go worse in high, highly unequal societies. And it's true, I mean, all of this is correlational. It's very hard to think of how you're gonna get um, causal inferences in the technical sense, but it's quite compelling when you look at the aggregate set of things that correlates with high inequality. Okay, so the one thing I want to talk about quite strongly or quite sharply is what we call inequality traps. And Patricio effectively was talking about this without calling them that. So an inequality trap is a situation of high inequality where the environment is such that there's something which everyone would like to participate in, right? But the poor, because they're poor, 
don't have the same access or ability to engage with these things as the rich. And because of this barrier to entry, the rich will invest, the poor don't, and because it was lucrative enough, the rich get these high returns, and the poor are excluded. And so, over time, this means that the poor remain relatively poor, whereas the rich take advantage of this lucrative opportunity, and so they become even more rich, or they're consolidated in their position of riches. And this can be for a person in the course of their lifetime, but it can also be intergenerationally as Patricio's explanation made. Yeah? So here's just an illustrative example for education. It could be in any dimension, it could be in multiple dimensions simultaneously, but we're just going to talk about uh, the education system. So let's start here. We've got a society with high income inequality, right? And you've got some households which can afford the really good schools, and some which can afford the middle school, and some which can't, and then they go to relatively poor schools. So you've got these unequal family backgrounds and resources, which generates unequal access to schools or access to high quality schools. So like here we've got no fee schools, but as Patricia said, and I think Nicola might talk about it later, I don't know, about the schooling system, that there's actually a quality gradient, which is quite striking. I'll show a little bit about it in a minute. So the point is that this inequality starts here, means that not all children at birth have the same chances because they're gonna get filtered through different schooling systems. And so they end up where disproportionately, if you're born poor, you're gonna be more likely to have low skills than if you're born rich. At which point you, at some point, enter the labor market, and you end up in a society where the people who have skills are very scarce, because our system was designed to create an abundance of unskilled labor. And so when you get to the labor market here, if you're in that small group with high skills, then basically your returns to education are fairly high, and you'll earn a lot of money. But if you're in the mass who don't make it into that small group, then basically you're in the group which there's a lot of people with your skills and not that much demand, and your wages go down. And so you come here, and basically you replicate the system. The, the large group of unskilled people earn low wages and have a serious unemployment problem, and the small group of highly skilled people have good jobs and stable jobs and high wages. And the system loops. And that's kind of the nature of an inequality trap. So if you take it seriously, then one of the things that you have to think about from a policy dimension, which again, in Ness Patricia's example clearly, is you need to try and break these loops. Figure out ways at different links where you can intervene to stop the chain. I need to just show these three pictures. So these are, because in fact, you guys talked about it a little bit, uh, Patricia. So this is Trump caps, which uh, Marie and Jeremy and Ariano were all involved with Nicola Kelly. This was a th another cap, uh, salary survey, the Cape Area Panel Study, mm -hmm. which surveyed a group of young people in Cape Town um, from 2002 till around 2008 or 10 or so, but I'm only using um, the first wave. And what I did was I took the group by income, by household per capita income, and I created three groups. I said low was quintiles one and two, middle was quintiles three and four, and upper was quintile five. Right? And this is the standardized literacy and Newbury score. So we, asked, we gave them a test, these students who were, who were age 14 to 22 at the time. Right? We gave them a test, and you can just standardize how well they scored. Right? So this is like the grade on the score, the distribution of grades. And what you see is that this distribution, which is for the poorest two, lies to the left of this distribution, which then lies to the left of this distribution. Right? So basically, this, the distribution shifts up as people get richer for the same age. And the, it's stronger than it. It's a first order stochastic dominance. Uh, it's, it's very striking, basically. Right. But what's more interesting, I'm going to go through the next two very fast. So this is 40 to 60. And the next one will be on the same axis, the same test, but it's the, the next age group, 17, 18, 19. And the one after that is 20, 21, 22. So it's kind of like repeated cohorts. Yeah. It's not the same people, but I would like to interpret it like that. Um, 
So let's go back. So these are 14 to 16, one age group up and one age group up. So, I mean, I don't know if you, well, let's try it one more time. What, what, what's happening, and it's easier perhaps if you print it out and just put them like that and look at the light, um, is that the first two groups are barely moving. They're actually more or less stable in that middle of the space. And the only group that's showing sharp movement to the right, which represents learning or improvement on the steps, is the Squinta 5 group, who are starting to heat up here. And by the way, the, the test is finite, so you couldn't score above 2. It was not possible to score above 2. And so there's a fair chance that this distribution would actually start moving further, right, if we had a more finely grained test. Um, and I guess the point was just to kind of give evidence to these, what I was talking about as an inequality trap, that what you're seeing is that the poor and middle class or middle income groups are getting schooling, which as they're aging, they're still not, or all the courts are not showing learning, which, you're sh which is manifest by age 14 to 16 already. Whereas the rich group is actually the one that's pulling away further and further, which is again your uh, Heckman story, actually, not so much Patricio's. Uh, yeah, let's give it to you, Steve. <laughs> okay, so my last slide. Um, so income inequality is intuitively simple. I think most people get the idea. But empirically, and when you try to work with it and try to do research, with it, it's, it's quite complex, and there's lots of decisions you have to make. You, you need to make decisions because you won't be able to proceed. Actually, the assumptions are necessary. But what is, I think, best practice is to make clear what assumptions you're using. Income aggregate of subcomponents derived from different types of assets of capital. So the point is to think of these as, as you've got assets or endowments, and then there's a prices. You get a return on your assets. You get a rental from your property. You get a return from the financial market. You get a return to your wages, and you can invest in skills and get a higher return to your labor, right? So if you're thinking of changing your income distribution or market income, you need to either have a change in the distribution of your assets and or a change in the distribution of prices. And so if you think of policy, it makes it clear which one are you targeting or both, but at least be clear what you're hoping to achieve here. So minimum wage, it's clear, is targeting primarily the prices of wage. Um, a direct inter intervention is to tax the risks and transfer the poor, that's what we just call taxes and transfers, and that's neat because it, it aims, the, the policy is direct, it's on the income distribution, it's not secondary. But, I mean, I think there's also a growing discussion or awareness, and it certainly came out from the Davis Commission, and one of our previous finance ministers was that there are limits to the tax and transfer system. And for something of this scale, you kind of have to also think of how you're going to change the way the market delivers. Like market income inequality is actually so big here that it's almost, it's very hard to see how you could expect the fiscus to do all of that work. You, have to, you can think of the fiscus, but you need to think of other processes and interventions as well. So that's all I have to say for now.